Labor is such a challenging uh, but also rewarding part of the industry. I think Rethink, um, Grow and Develop as a theme is, is absolutely uh, relevant to you guys. Um, it's great to have such a, a fantastic members of the farming community, some faces that you will know here around me uh, and others that you won't. Um, but firstly, and I will call you local dairy farmers, Dave and Penny Con. And some people will go, hang on, no they're not. But yes, they are local, um, whose footprint has extended across South East Australia, as you'll see shortly. Um, but also uh, Aubrey Pallet, who's made a great contribution to the industry, both at farm level, um, but also at industry uh, level and in agribusiness, but also uh, equally in board roles as well. So um, has made a huge contribution uh, to the industry uh, over the last 20, 30 years. And Tim Gelbart, of course, um, whose name is synonymous with Gippsland Dairy, I think, really. Um, and that's not the milk brand, but, but dairying in Gippsland. Um, who's made, uh, whose family, but also um, Tim, made a great contribution to the industry. So really, it's today is about listening to their stories and hearing probably that they don't do it perfectly, but they do it well, probably really well, and maybe to some people, really, really well. Um, because their stories are phenomenal and their structures and their and their businesses are pretty impressive. And I don't want anyone here that's perhaps milking a smaller number of cows um, to go away thinking this is about big, this is about, you know, you've got to be uh, big to be good or you've got to grow to, to be, uh, you know, successful. It's actually hearing about the stories of these people and their businesses and what they've done to work for them and hopefully work for them. Um, in both their, their business lives, but also their personal lives. So without any further ado, we'll, we'll jump into that. Aubrey, uh, up on the screen, and, and you don't have to look because you know your business well, but I've put the, uh, the details there of your farm. Can you just give us a brief overview uh, of your farm and, and then we'll jump into your labour structure as well. Okay, um, is it turned on? Thanks, Matt. Um, so we're at a little place called Hill End. Um, we are largely pasture based, a small amount of irrigation. Uh, I quite enjoy growing things, so I've, I've um, over the years started to still have as much pasture as I can get, but I like to grow other crops um, and try to make them pay. Um, we've developed a system really where we don't use many contractors. Um, and have started to do everything ourselves, which I think I've said to Matt in the past has actually resulted in a more complicated farming system than what I started off with 20 years ago when I thought I'm not going to own any piece of equipment and it's going to be all pasture and I'm originally from New Zealand as some people know and so now I'm really doing completely the opposite to that. Now Aubrey we caught up and I think it was a couple of years ago now and, and dissected your labour structure at the time and, and really decided that there was a pathway for you which probably involved some overseas people and I've put your structure up there now on the screen. Um, what's evolved with that labour structure? So I guess it's worth saying previous to that, well I've been farming just over 20 years. We've always employed people. Um, and when I was younger, uh, and Jackie was younger, we had less labour. Uh, and we had a, uh, a couple work for us for probably 12 years, and um, that worked reasonably well. So this structure here is in the last six, seven months, really. But we talked to Matt about moving to Jackie and myself, thinking, well, actually, the reality is we're getting older physically finding it more difficult. Um, what used to seem easy now is um, less appealing. Um, and also, even a bit mentally, um, probably fair to say less resilient than in the past. So the ambition was, I'd like to have largely the day-to-day -day farming operation. So milking, feeding cows, um, largely the day-to-day -day stuff just covered off that I can keep an eye on. I still want to be farming. I still want to be there. I don't want a farm manager um, for various reasons just yet. So this structure here is what we uh, ended up with. Um, and two of those people are internationals, uh, Abdullah and Jerry. 
So I might come back to that in terms of how you found that process, um, but thanks for that overview, uh, Aubrey. Sorry, what's wrong way? Dave and Penny, um, give us a little bit of an overview. Again, it's up there on the screen. Um, you know your business is quite, uh, quite well, but as I said, your footprint has extended. Give us a little bit of uh, background and, and current far away. That's working? Yep, all good. Um, where do I start? I suppose I started milking cows when I was about 19, milking 93 cows for my father and mother. It's a share farm situation. I've developed for this. A lot of debt, as is everyone. Um, the structures have evolved over the years. Um, we realised earlier on we wanted to, to build a business like this, so we had to get good at employing labour um, and doing all of these things. Um, <coughs> What uh, I'm going to put now, I'm going to put the next screen up, and I was I was going to hold off on this, but it, it probably will blow some people's minds a little bit. There is your business on a slide, um, and you started what ninety three cows, yeah, ninety cows, 90 cows, 90 cows yeah. share farmers at at Headley. Um, <laughs> Siri. Siri wants to know how to uh, how to milk 90 cows <laughs> in their farm arrangement. <laughs> it wasn't silent. So. <laughs> um, I suppose as opportunities come along, we've taken them. Um, I love looking at real estate windows, so <laughs> comparing prices. Um, started in Gippsland, uh, went to Flinders Island 20 years ago. Land was cheap. Thought it was good country, um, good opportunities, and we've grown grant to what it is. We've been lucky farms have come up next door and the quiet ones have come up. We went We've always been very keen, always kept an eye on the Went to the Western District five, six years ago, that's been very good too. Got um, it's all about people too. We've got very good key people, um, managers and chair farmers, which has made the difference. So can you give us a little bit of an overview because I presume people can see that structure at the back. Um, You've got a mix of different structures within that that tree of uh, or mesh of uh, businesses. Roughly speaking, um, how are they employed? How are they um, structured in those in those business units? Um, the dairy in Gippsland, we've got uh, what two dairies in Gippsland. One's a contract manager, which John Mulvaney and Matt set that up years ago. Just excellent. Um, so they, this person owns all the all machinery and employs all labour and we pay him enough for depreciation and to employ labour and to for his own labour. We've got a 50-50 uh, one here in Gippsland which we're about to shut down. We're going to run beef cattle from Flinders Island up to here. So the bloke that was contract manager on the Gippsland stuff, he's now going to become our beef manager here and we're employing another young bloke who's going to be 50-50 share milker on that farm. Uh, the Flinders Island stuff, Penny and myself have run one place there, about 1,900 cows for the last, I was built to 1,900 cows uh, up to about 18 months ago. Our son's just come home, he's going to look after, he's got his own place, going to look after ours, and we've also got a contract manager on a 1,400 cow unit down there. Same as the dairy here in Gippsland. He owns all the machinery and employs all labour. So there's a, a contract manager, um, our property, and our son's going to run his and our place that we're running and oversee that, that part of the operation. Uh, the Western District stuff, we've got um, a, uh, what's a, two, yeah, a 50 50 share milker out there, two units, one's about, I think it's 1200 cows roughly on two units out there. We also bought another property off a of corporate um, 12 months ago. The only way we could be able to buy it was to lease it back to him. They wanted to still run the property. So we bought it, basically land banked it. We hope to get that back the next year or two. Uh, and then we just bought another run out paddock a bit further away. So we we'll probably got 1,400 cows out there that we'll be directly controlling, where our share farm will. And then eventually it'll go to about 1,800 cows over the next couple of years, we hope. So. And then a bit of commercial stuff in one season. So, so I'm going to come back to that, and I'm going to certainly quiz Henny about what works and what doesn't work with that. But we'll, um, we'll hear uh, Tim's story as well um, and then we'll launch into some some more varied questions.
So, Tim, give us an overview. Quite a few here may know a bit of your story and background, um, but for those that don't, um, can you give us a little bit of uh, insight into gel bark berries? Sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, our family business, Dad started in 79 with Mum, milking 100 cows, uh, quite quickly grew over the sort of next decade into the early 90s, milking 300 cows. Um, obviously grew up on the farm uh, and went to school in Melbourne and was actually away from the dairy for 10 years um, doing commercial old agricultural valuations all over Australia. Um, lived in Sydney for five years. Unfortunately, uh, lost mum in 2014 and we had started the succession planning probably about 2012 before we knew mum was sick. And then, unfortunately, six months after mum passed away, dad um, developed a similar situation. So that really accelerated the succession planning that, you know, potentially we got three months to get this sorted out. Thankfully, all three of the boys, I've got two older brothers, have all external jobs. My eldest brother's a builder. Middle brother's got a, sells veggie seeds commercially all over Australia and New Zealand. So all of us had jobs outside of the dairy, um, which I think really helped. Um, I always wanted to come back, probably just not when I did. Um, it was a bit earlier than I thought. Luckily, they had external jobs. I wanted to come back. We're all really good mates, so succession was easy. <laughs> and then it's just been a very steep learning curve straight into the milk price crash when I came back. Um, and then, thankfully, benefited from a few recent good seasons and just fine-tuned management and what we do. So, Tim, I'm going to put your structure up now on the screen um, because you've got quite a range of uh, people and, and um, positions in the business and, and that formalised structure as I think you sort of touched on there with the succession plan. So you might, can you talk us through um, some of those positions because if people can see there is quite a bit of tenure in there. We hear all the time about people not being uh, able to retain labour or, or attract labour. Um, from your pictures up there it doesn't look like you have a big issue. No, you missed the mechanic, 15 and a half years. Um, uh -huh. Actually, 27. Um, <laughs> but look, I think some things really resonated with me the short time I had with Dad when I was back on the farm. The one comment he made to me is, remember, your workers work to live. They don't live to work like farm owners do. And I think that stuck with me the whole time, that if you're asking someone to come in on a Friday night or do two weekends straight, they've got families, they've got people they need to get home to, other commitments just like we do. We get the benefit of asset growth and wealth and the joy of creating a business. They don't necessarily have that, so you need to understand that they've got families and lives too. So that really resonated with me. Um, although I don't do very many milkings, I do nearly everything else on the farm and I'm there every day. People see when my hands dirty and you know, down in the effluent pond, whatever it is, I'm there doing the jobs, covering soil, which fits with everyone else. Um, and just respecting that they're people. They have lives, and I probably spend a day a week just talking to staff. Like, if you added up all the 15, 20-minute chats throughout the week um, across the 20 staff, pretty quickly you wonder what you've achieved for the day, but you've probably put out three fires that might have festered into a disaster two weeks later because someone's annoyed that they've had a crappy morning and just being heard I think is as much anything that people want to be heard and if, they, if you're not there and you don't care and you just rock up every now and then um, that's when the issues have developed, it's already past the point of repair, they're sick of it, I'm gone I'm done, so yeah. So is that part of the longevity um, of your staffing system, um, do you think they feel that value that you obviously have in them? You you have that value. You've just explained that. Do you think they feel that value, and is that part of the the retention of staff? Uh, I'm very open with our staff. There's not many things that they don't know. There's certain things they don't know, but I'm always communicating what's happening on the farm in the next 12 months and how we've gone and what our major 
pinch points are, you know, about quality issues with milk. So let's bring the whole team together and work through that program. And we've been fortunate to have people there that were there long before. Like I said, our mechanic started in 96. So started as milk and cows and went... So he's done... And he's almost been there longer than I have. Um, we have. So we've been fortunate to have a few people that have long tenure, but... Um, People generally seem happy. The one thing I've noticed the last three or four years, you walk to the lunchroom and you hear laughter. People chatting, and I'm not there saying, get to work, go and do your jobs. Very rarely do I raise my voice unless someone's riding a motorbike without a helmet or they haven't checked the oil in the bike. But just having a conversation, like in the corporate space, and I guess I've had that benefit, you have the water cooler chats. You know, you get that, oh, I'm standing around for 10 minutes, so I'm not actually doing anything. Yes, it's a wasted 10 minutes and we probably pay a bit more for labour than what most do, but people are fresh and when you expect them to work, they'll work because we just had a break. Before milking, they're about to embark in five and a half hours of milking cows without a break. So if they spend 40 minutes before milking just having a chat and not being 100% productive, well, does it really matter at the end of the day? Is that 40 minutes going to make or break the business? Probably not. If they're not there milking the cows, that will have a bigger impact. Thanks, Tim. Penny, um, you, you've got a different structure of employment and engagement than what Tim does uh, and, and to what Aubrey does, but you've got really good length of um, uh, longevity or length of, yeah. uh, of employment. How do you, is, do you deal with it in a similar way to Tim? I totally agree with what Tim has said. You know, we, we make a point of trying to listen to our staff and... Um, and and even preempting some of the things they want. You know, one example, one of our staff members, you know, he ended up going back to the third child, got four with twins. We built on an extra bathroom and an extra bedroom. He never even asked, but we knew long term, and he's still with us. He's been with us the best part of 20 years. That that's what he needed, and he, you know, and it was oh, well, it's our fault. We keep pumping out kids here, but we've got three, four girls. You're going to need another bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, and one of them, yes, <laughs> definitely. So, yeah, I mean, people management is key and and looking after them, and, it, and it's often not about the money, it, it's about that feeling of being valued and, and um, you know, I mean, we actually have people that come to us wanting work and, you know, most of our managers are people that we've, known for a long time or have heard about us and have said we want to come work for you can you find us a place and you know to extent at one stage we were looking for a farm for a young bloke I and mean, we didn't end up finding it but he is we kept him in mind and he is about to start with us in the next few weeks so yeah i mean it is it's just about looking after people aubrey um You've been down this pathway, and, and as I mentioned before, and, and I'll put it back up there just so people can see that, I've, I, I think really probably trying to approach it in the way that these guys have. Has it worked for you? Is, you know, do the best, by, by best laid plans play out, or uh, do things not always go to plan? The short answer is that it hasn't worked. Um, and I was just going to say, so up until this structure, we've been farming just over 20 years, we've never advertised either. And we always had people knock on the door at the right time, want a job, or someone knew of someone. And um, I guess, I wouldn't say you get lazy, but I've probably assumed, um, or I didn't realise how things had changed so much in the background. And so I don't think this has anything to do with COVID either that when we decided we wanted to change our staffing structure, all of a sudden, there was just nobody to be found. Um, we used a, a, a Warrigal-based recruitment company, and after two months, they could give us zero people to even interview. Um, and so that was a bit of a shock. And the international option, really, it, I wouldn't say it was my preference, but I had heard a few farmers and their experiences, and so I thought, okay, maybe this is going to work. Um, and we were enthusiastic, um, and we, 
there's a couple of learnings out of that. And that one was it took a very long time to, to from when we uh, interviewed the people to when they actually arrived on farm. It took a very long time. I'm talking six to nine months. And uh, in the meantime, that nearly killed us because we were covering everything ourselves. And you know, you get to the point where you think, I'm not, I don't want to do this anymore. And then you're actually doing more of it than you ever have for that period of time. Um, but anyway, the, the two internationals were have come to Australia on a skilled visa, so they have experienced milking cows, and that's what we wanted. We we actually want people, okay, you can milk, we'll tell you how our system runs and the differences between where you may have worked before and what we expect, etc., etc. One of them worked in Saudi Arabia on a very large dairy farm. The other one had worked in Japan. So I knew they probably didn't know much about pasture and grazing, and that, that was fine. But the reality is um, they have really struggled. Uh, and so we have been very frustrated. Um, they're both individually very nice people, um, get on great with them. But I haven't quite worked out what it is about why they might do some things and don't do other things. Um, and they definitely, there's lots of overlaying levels of subtlety, you know, some of it's cultural. Um, some of it is the farming system. Some of it is they've, they've worked in teams of 700 people, you know. So they, they're not very... It was a shock to them to have the boss, as they might say, right in front of them. And they almost feel a bit intimidated. And, uh, you know, so, and we've... Look, we've... There's other things I was telling Matt before, like the, the driving licence thing is actually... I had... That slipped through to the keeper, really. I never really thought about that much. But Explain they, it, Aubrey. Well, yeah. they, they obviously they don't have Australian driving licences, but more than that, the Kenyan fellow, for instance, had never never driven the car, never driven a motorbike, never driven or ridden a bicycle. And that really threw me. So when he first arrived at the farm, I'd gone and bought two new two-wheelers to say, right, I drive up to the dairy, we'll leave the four-wheeler at the dairy, jump on the two-wheeler, thinking, well, he... Um, yeah, he's not from Kenya, right? Everyone's ridden a motorbike, I was thinking. He, he probably hasn't driven a car. but it, So he, he diligently didn't tell me that he didn't get on there, and I was busy explaining clutch, gear shift, brakes, you know, just like any motorbike, I was thinking. And then he had about 35 goes at making the thing start. Or I realised for his own safety, OK, we better forget about that. But so anyway, the obligation for the employer is quite significant. So we take them to supermarket shopping. And we've got them on the mobile mobile market, as they call it now. But um, you know, anything they need, we have to. T- and that's okay, but not for four years. It, you know, so I'm not sure about the pathway to the driving license thing. It's going to be a difficult road. So really, some of these almost down to the life skills. And I, and I don't want to make that sound you know culturally inappropriate, but you know the the culture is different, and their life skills are different to what you've got here. I'll give you a couple of little, exa- little examples. So we provide a fully furnished house, and you sort of have to, really. I mean, they're coming from overseas, and you don't know their backgrounds, really. But the Kenyan fellow had never used a toaster. He'd seen it in the movies, he's saying. And he's an intelligent guy. Um, they've never used an oven. So, you know, it's only cooktops they've used and things that we just take for granted and didn't even think about, you know. And um, so... It's, in a way, it's interesting, right? It's interesting learning about their backgrounds and where they're from. But then you've sort of got the dual tension of your their employer. You want them to do the job. They don't really know how to do the job, but they're getting there and you're encouraging them. And you're also trying to tell them about Australia. And and I, I've worked out. This, they've been with me more than six months now. They Where they've worked previously and their attitude is really they've come here to work their life is, you might say, 90% working, 10% lifestyle. Lifestyle to them is relatively insignificant. Um, and I was talking to one of them the other day saying, you know, look, most people in Australia, lifestyle was a much bigger percentage than that. Uh, and, you know, I said, for your own well-being, I want you to be able to enjoy the things about Australia. You know, you get strictly five days on, two days off, and we've always done that. And I said, on the, f- on the two days off, we'd noticed that in the house... They don't even open the curtains. You know, little things like that, you've got to let go through the keeper. But they don't go anywhere and do anything. And they, But they don't even... I don't think that's a frustration to them. It's actually a frustration to me because I think, oh, you're missing out on things. Tim, you've, you've got a couple of um, 
sponsored positions, are, are they similar uh, to Aubrey and Jackie's structure? or And have you found the same thing? Or are they more the backpacker? As you, you're chuckling, so maybe you found um, a similar uh, experience? Yeah, look, for me it was more around providing stability on some key roles. Right, we do a lot of hook trimming. Animal health is quite an important part of the business. So if we can have key staff that we know are there for a period of time that have the skills. So that was number one, I guess, is how can we get key people into these roles for lack of younger Australians that want to get into the dairy. The thing I notice about the internationals, there is differentials between nationalities. Got an Indian guy and two Kenyans. Um, so there's some subtle differences there, but they are grateful for a job. Uh, they're most of the time very respectful and they they got to want for knowledge like they they really want to do well and so i guess you can foster that whereas opposed to typical australian person coming in they just want to earn some money and go home they don't really care what happens day to day whereas you know some of our guys are like no i need to stay back to fix this cow because she won't yeah, she's no good for tomorrow or I just need to stay back and do that. Um, I was going to say the other thing that we really try and it's sort of not really depicted in that but across our staff we try and find people's strengths and put them in buckets to say like one person might be really good at doing water so he controls all the water. Another guy does all their paddock rotations. Another one does all the fencing. Another then we've got a mechanic. So all the day-to-day -day jobs that you have across a farm, there's people that get spoken to, even well below management level, saying that trough's leaking, that fence is broken, there's no power in that back paddock. 90% of the problems are fixed before I even know about them um, and before the manager knows about them because the staff have talked amongst themselves and said, oh, Stu will fix that or Ash can go and do that. Um, so there's ownership around the issues. Yeah, and so the flip side of that is it's great for me because I don't get 90% of the calls. The flip side also is that that person that goes home that knows that trough's leaking, when they come in the morning, they're like, I've got to go fix that trough as soon as I get in because it's leaking. So they then take ownership on some of the jobs and you're not trying to find them jobs every day. It's like, oh, if I'm not fixing that trough, I've got Tim wants a new water line somewhere else or... They actually have some ownership on their job so they can be self-sufficient when they come in. And I think that's made a really big difference. And even just the camaraderie between the staff. So, oh, someone's... We introduced a slab rule for anyone that knocks over a gate post because the guy that replaces them gets sick of it. But just that banter that comes around, you know, oh, so-and-so knocked out a post, no has got to replace it, but, you know, there's a slab for the Christmas party sitting there. David Penny, and, and I don't mind which of you answers that answers this, but how do you deal with with less hands-on to what Tim and Aubrey are? How do you deal with those issues of the people you've got in the in your looking after your assets, um, taking the care and and the ownership around that, being so hands-off? Uh, a couple of things probably with Tim in that you find the people who are good at doing jobs or like doing jobs and done well. The other thing too, Matt, yourself and John Mulvaney, Angus Drummond, are key people in our business. Is that level between the managers and us? But often the managers don't want to talk to us about generally they do, but it might be an issue they're not happy about. And it comes back down through Matt and John and Angus Drummond, a few others we use. That's a big part of it. So now what was your question again, sorry? So so there's a you've got oversight. Yeah. So you've got overseas if you like in that. Um, do do the staff take the care and I'll call them staff, but, yeah. but I mean, essentially, they're almost business operators in themselves because they're contractors or share farmers. They're yeah. partners, okay? Yeah. Yep. They're partners. That's with the share farming. 50-50 model works particularly well, and so is the contract manager model. Um, uh, there's a couple of, a couple of our people who've got their own farms. One in the Western District particularly has got a 300 cow farm of his own. So they do take care. Um, they've got a lot of skin in the game. Um, it works well that way, I think. I think too, because they are the managers and they're joining on the spot, if they don't fix that trough, they're the ones who've got to deal with the fallout. You know, I mean, yes, it costs us, but they have to deal with the crap and being mud deep you know, or knee deep in the mud. 
So there's so there's ownership, there's responsibility, um, and there's just self uh, self uh, what's, what's it? Right. self interest. That's the word. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, yeah, true self interest in in fixing the issues. Yeah, we do make sure we provide the capital so the properties are done, maintained, or generally when we buy a place for flat and we start again, loads of fencing and water. So it's fairly new infrastructure. So um, a bit of an incentive for the people to keep everything right. A bit of pride in the job. Don't expect them to put up with old infrastructure. We also are not frightened to spend money on maintaining infrastructure and keeping it good. So safety is important. Keeping the infrastructure up to scratch is important. Their welfare is important. Mm. Yep. Absolutely. How do you deal, and I'm, uh, I'm going to ask the question to, to all three members, about that growth of your employees or contractors or share farmers or, or whatever it might be, um, to allow them to grow within your business. Does, this, does your business have the opportunity for them to grow, and I might start with Tim, um, or do, do they have to grow elsewhere? Um, it's a good question. I obviously think a lot how can we do more for some of our younger staff you had a big bucket of cash you go and buy farms for people but it's not that easy these days um i guess the natural progression you know the salary increases over time and you know their bonus sort of a discretionary bonus but if people want to train we'll push them to training courses and we'll try and upskill them and some of our younger staff members I'll try and mentor along the way to say, you know, I think you could be a really good share farmer, you know, learn what you can from us and Mike the manager and and go. But I think a lot of younger people now don't see the five-year plan. It's more about here and now. And so I can't say that there's a really good career progression other than just taking on a bit more responsibility on the farm itself and then... Um, you know, we're not afraid to put people in charge of their own little segment in the business. And I think that's probably as much as anything, just giving people some ownership of a position on the business so they feel like they're important because they're in charge of water or they're in charge of the grazing roster. Um, and then so they've got that, that self-interest factor, you know, that they're looking after it because they're, it's their responsibility. And it's also a touch point for me with them because I'll come and like, oh, how'd you go with that crop? Or how do you go with this? You can automatically start a conversation, which, you know, there's one of our people that you walk past him in the morning and he'll almost just grunt at you. And, you know, he... If you can get him engaged and talking for a minute, you won't shut him up. But if I didn't have something that I knew interests him or an area that I can't just go, oh, well, how are you going? Because it just... Mm. Yep. But you just get him talking for a split second on that area that he's invested in and then you've got 20 minutes, half an hour of conversation. So. Aubrey, do you think your your business, or are you heading to a business model that allows for that uh, you know, transition, I won't call it succession as such, um, but transition of key employees or, or do you see the short term, you and Jackie still being as, uh, pretty integral to it? In the short term, and I, I guess I'm thinking five years, right? Um, probably Jack and I are still going to be actually um, managing everything. We had an experience with our previous employees where I really tried to foster that there's heaps of opportunities come through. You know, we pro in, in hindsight, it, did, it didn't work, and we probably, you know, I've been a bit burnt by it, to be honest. You know, we, we gave them calves and... Um, encouraged them. I even went to the extent of buying a book on buying property and you know, given their background, really try and make them think about asset growth and the opportunities that were there and talked about, you know, we're getting older and things are changing the business in time, right? It actually didn't work at all. We've been a little bit burnt and so now one of the attractive things about the international workforce is, you know, I think they're very content to, they come, they've got a role, they do the job, um, and they've got to get a lot better at doing the job, but at the moment, that's the plan. It does leave us wondering a little bit about, you know, what, what we're going to do. Um, I guess we viewed this structure we have now as the first step. Um, we thought, we actually like farming. Um, 
we'll, we'll keep going. We don't know if our children will be interested in being active. We employ our son, but he doesn't like anything to do with cows. He's machinery only, and that's fine. He's only 18. Um, so we don't don't really know. We thought we could still we still enjoy a lot of the day to day stuff. We just want that the test of working for us is if we could be away for seven days. At the moment, there's just no no way knowing. You know, like one of us is. Jackie's on the farm because I'm here. You know, there's no way both of us could be here. That's the way we view it, and we we might, you know, we could, we probably prefer things to happen how we want them to happen. That's a, that's the personality we have. Yeah. Now, that's a good point, and I know we've got a very big contrast in in probably stage of business um, here. How hands on are you guys in this structure? Um. We like to think we can run anything, uh, all the stuff anywhere in the world with the computer and the phone, and we do. We do travel a lot, so, um, yeah, hands off, I suppose, and just let managers do their thing and guide them. And I know that's not saying that Aubrey's model's no no good or, you know, you need to aspire or, or Tim's model, but would you guys have any advice or any cross-advice or to counter advice to these guys if they wanted to or anyone else in the audience if they wanted to get to this structure and I'm not saying you want to get to this structure by the way but yeah I think a big part of it is we don't wind our operations up too much we probably at 85 or 90 percent once you get above that I feel you put a lot of pressure on people so we're still making good returns um, uh, everyone does what you know everyone's got a different ambition in life too mm. That's a big part of it. What, what, you, what drives you, what gets you out of bed in the morning, what your ambitions are. So you'd say that last 10 or 20% is what can tip things over or tip the people over? Would that be a fair comment? Yeah, I don't think... A lot of managers aren't... We've got probably one of the Wests probably winding up a bit more, but um, that last 10% in our experience puts a lot of pressure on people. We don't have much machinery ourselves either. We're very different from a lot of people. Very little... Uh, Machinery is a depreciating asset. I'd rather buy land or shares or commercial. It's just our way of thinking about things. and No one's wrong in what they do. But that's the great thing about farming. There's so many ways of doing it. and so many successful ways of doing it, just the way we do it. Tim, that that comment, because I, I, I reckon you guys chase do chase the last 10%, <laughs> knowing how gel barts operate. Um, do, could you accept the 80% rule under a different structure or do you think that's why your structure you know works works right for you guys now uh, yeah I agree the last 10% sometimes takes 30% to get um, and it works for us because I'm a numbers person and I'm there most of the time and systems are in place you've got the people to support it if I was remote we'd probably wind it back a little bit um, but one of the things I was going to say is the way we've got, you know, staff trained in buckets and tenure, I think there's 145 years of experience on our farm at the moment. And I'm going away for a couple of weeks, then the next week. Um, and I don't, other than the specific projects I'm working on, I don't worry about that because I know, worst, I'm a phone call away, but the farm will run to 80% while I'm away. Like, and I think that's what that's the big thing for an owner is to accept that mistakes happen things aren't going to be perfect and they're not going to be done how you would do them and I have this never ending battle with our mechanic about people that drive over sticks and they do this and they do that and um, I agree with him, it's frustrating but I have to accept that it's part of employing people and you get things that break and gate posts that get run over that shouldn't have I wouldn't have done that. But if you go and blast that person and say, you're no good, you're always doing this, you don't actually achieve anything. The gateposts are still broken. And, you know, you need the staff. So I think that's where a lot of people, or some people could improve about looking that there is going to be mistakes and shortfalls and accepting that the farm runs to 80% when you're not there. Um, and when you're there, hopefully you can get it to 99, 100%. But... Um, yeah, I think that's the succession for me. If I can walk away, I'll get hit by a bus tomorrow. The farm keeps running. Um, yes, my brother would have to step in and sort out some financial stuff, but 
the farm and the actual business operations, despite what I think, I could be wiped out tomorrow when it would still keep going. Um, and that's a that's a testament to the legacy that's been put and the structure that's put, been put in place and and maintained and strengthened by you, Jim. Yeah, that, that's probably a, a comment rather than a question. But oh, it's just a springboard. Yeah. Dad and Mum created it, mm. but it's now. I'm already looking to, I'm 38, and we're talking about succession for the next generation. So I've hopefully got 20 years left in me at least. But the succession talk, we're only five years into having inherited from mum and dad, and we're already having a conversation about what does this look like? What do we invest in now? Are the kids going to come home? What happens if they don't? So it's a never-ending story, I guess. Yeah. Could I just say too, I think... For us to wind our operation up much more, it exposes to risk, price fluctuation, and put costs. So we're trying to keep our risk very minimal. I think you'd agree with that, Matt, would yeah, you? Ab- absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to touch on that, um, you know, the business structure and and really, you know, I don't want to talk about anyone if they were hit by a bus tomorrow, but, you know, would your business continue to tick along? Have you got the knowledge in the business for it to continue? Absolutely. It- doesn't need us. I mean, we go away for months at a time. I mean, sure, we do the books and we do that, but we have people in place. Yep. <laughs> Matt, Matt, sorry, um, yep. we are pressured for time, and yep. uh, I'd also just like to welcome the Yarram Secretary students who are sitting at the top. Um, unless you've got some real pivotal ones, we might uh, go yeah. to the audience for some questions. I'll let you lead that. Absolutely. So we are happy, and I think you guys are happy to take any questions about relative, fairly much anything. Um, if anything's really inappropriate, I might vet it. But, um, well, Aubrey, did you, and, uh, and just to kick it off, I suppose, um, do you see the structure that these guys have put in place? Um, because you're probably in that bus bus risk category. Um, yeah, do you see that as somewhere that you could strengthen up your business? And then if anyone wants to ask a question from there, go for it. Yes, I would prefer to be, uh, you know, closer to that scenario. Um, and, you know, in my mind, I think uh, my level of debt is constraining me. You know, but I could be wrong. That, that's uh, there's probably other ways I could do it. But the way I look at it, that if it was me or Jackie that wasn't in the business, it'd probably be okay. If both, if something happened to both of us, then there'd be serious problems. Yeah. Pete's got a question. Thanks, Pete. Hi there. Um, Peter Neves from Newry. Um, just a, one for David and Penny. Um, you still see any opportunities out there at the moment um, buying land and with the prices and the interest rates? Is there, um, are you still looking to buy more or are you you're backing off there? I think I can safely say absolutely there's heaps of opportunities and we're always looking and, yeah, definitely. Yeah, or even overseas, possibly. I don't know yet. But there are opportunities overseas. Um, did you want to follow that, Pete, with where? Because <laughs> they're not letting on. <laughs> I'll just keep quiet on that. <laughs> uh, g'day, Stu Griffin uh, from Westbury. Uh, to Dave and Penny as well, with the structure... You know, with that number of farms and a, and a structure that what that large, I mean, I'll get myself on in the same bus category as Aubrey. Um, as far as if uh, if it all fell over, it'd be it'd be a bit of a mess. So, with with that, how do you how do you set or, or what's your involvement in setting the the big picture settings for the farms? Is it is it you, you have fair involvement in it's going to be around this number of cows? You're going to feed about this much? We're aiming to produce this much you guys make it happen, or does that sit, at, and with the beef, you know, you're going to breed this many, you're going to sell them at this time, or is that left to the managers a bit more than than those things? Uh, with the beef job, uh, the managers certainly decide when to sell cattle. Well, it's fairly apparent with that side of it. The dairy stuff, um, the main ones in the West, they're very switched on. Kiwis, we've got a few Kiwis, they're great. Really good. Um, so he's got skin the game, he gets more production or more profitable production good for him and us. That's where the 50-50 milk works particularly well. The stuff here in the east, um, he's just a good, solid fellow that's been with us for years and uh, just works. It's amazing. Just He's an unusual fellow, but 
Daddy's now going to go to a 50 50 because that bloke is one milk cows who wants to wear But I think the 50 50 gives everyone incentive. Yeah. And just a quick follow up. And, and do you think that, that running at around 80% makes that, the 80 to 90% makes that a bit easier? They, it, it, it's almost set and forget. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Oh, the, the, you say you run the farms at maybe 80 or 90%. You think that makes it easier to be a bit more set and forget? I think so, yeah. Oh, 85 to 90, I'd like to say, yeah. I think... Yeah, I think so. That's that's our experience. A um, lot of machinery, a lot of people wound right up. It exposes people to risk a lot of pressure on people. People don't want... Most people don't want pressure. I would say our general ethos is keep it simple, stupid. The KISS method. And, and I think set and forget... Um, is a fair description of it, but it shouldn't be seen as negative because I think you've worked out where your profitable positions are on stocking rate, feed inputs, um, you know, cow type, fertility levels that you need to drive the business. Would that be fair? fair point? Yeah, it's fair, but I would also say, I mean, we are available 24-7. If, if one of the managers wants us, they know they can ring at any time. And, and quite often the fellas will ring David and the women will ring me, you know, and it's just the way it works. Everything is benchmarked every year too, so we're working within parameters, particularly the beef stuff. And then like Matt and John Mulvaney have been extremely, and Angus Drummond and Sandy have been really good people to give us an idea of where we should be at what we're trying to do. Matt, yeah. uh, Aaron Thomas, local dairy farmer. Um, for someone who's about to employ all management on our farm within weeks, uh, what advice would you have to share for myself? I'm going to refer that to, well, probably to these two. So can I give a little bit of background? Stepping from management to contract management. So we're stepping across into your structure. So actually, I shouldn't have just directed anyone here can answer this question. Um, so Aaron will be employing and managing uh, the staffing under a contract arrangement. Yeah, any, any pointers? Put a contract manager on, go to Queensland, leave him to it. <laughs> Put someone like Matt in, in there as well. Leave them to it. Um, assuming you are the contract manager, yeah. so you can't just employ another person to do your job. Um, I think make sure you do a thorough interview question and have listed out the important things to you and the, the things you need that person to have. So is it that the farming side of it you've got across really easily, but you need someone that's good with people... Or is it, like, where do you actually need the skills? Often if people have people skills, you can teach them the rest. If people have bad people skills, it's very hard to train that out of them, and I think that can affect your culture. Um, the same thing, they're um, working to live, so just remember that. Um, and just engage with them daily, regularly, um, and get them invested in your business, I guess. And... The other takeaway is never stop looking. Often we'll employ someone, we'll have two people over what we actually need because the inevitable is in two months' time someone will leave or someone will get sick or someone will move on. So never stop looking for the right person because you might have someone come to you when you're fully staffed, they got awesome skills and you say, I don't have a position. In a month's time someone, like, find a position for that person because the inevitable will happen, someone will move on. So... That's my philosophy, and often I'm like, how do we find somewhere to put these people? But then in a month's time, someone comes and pulls the pin and says, I'm gone. He had no idea they're going. So never stop looking for the right person. I'll just quickly say, um, spend a bit of time understanding both people's objectives and what makes them tick, you know, because sometimes you don't quite understand, and that all goes to the expectations, you know, why is someone working hard or not working hard or what are you trying to achieve what are they trying to achieve and you know is the match there um, and uh, it can be very subtle of course and you, I often find I work it out after a year or two and I wish I'd known that you know in the first month sort of thing thanks great question Aaron um, yeah. sorry I was just going to add one little trick that we've learnt over the years with employing people is to often go to their place and interview them there 
because as soon as you see that front gate, you, you learn so much. And it's a really good just little trick to, to go and see them in their, their home environment. I've seen quite a few nods out there in the uh, audience to that one. Um, all right, we are out of time, um, and I do really want to thank, and I'll get everyone to thank um, the panel members that make this session work.